is Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. Uh, hello and welcome to Off Track with Hinch and Rossi, Thursday episode. Um, and we're all in different places again. Why did you again. put emphasis on my name? Well, because well, the Tuesday episode is... on the and. Right, it's Off Track with oh. Hinge or Rossi is Tuesday. And this is we had Jamie. Rossi. We sure. had Jamie. So, I mean, sometimes it's Off Track week. with Rossi or Hinge. Yeah, it's... Yes, no, I mean, not, I was just going usually. with how it's... No. Well, yeah. Eh, yeah, the Tuesday show's had a couple, for sure. Mm. Um, how's how's Farms? Where are you, um, Alex? We're not gonna we're not gonna say the name of where I'm at. Um, oh. <laughs> why I, not? Just because. Um, so after, <laughs> can I still call it Bubbleberry Ranch, that. or can I just have a different Bubble, name every Bubble, time? Bubbleberry Ranch works just fine. Was I right um, the first time? Yeah. Oh, sh- I was actually trying to get it wrong. <laughs> oh. I was going to call it a wild. different berry every time. I, I actually no, forgot no, what it was called. No, no, no. It's well, you nailed it, Bubbleberry Ranch. So um, right. <clears throat> after after Portland, usually Kelly's birthday falls like on the gap week between races, um, and we always try and take a trip somewhere. So we've usually been on the West Coast because the finales are usually in Laguna. So um, we usually go somewhere out there. But this year. Um, it's obviously not the case. So after Portland, I flew to meet her, um, in somewhere in the Midwest in, in Tennessee. And, uh, we're just here for a couple of days, go home. We're recording on Tuesday. So I go home tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, and then head up to Milwaukee on Thursday, but nice little three day getaway, um, celebrate her birthday and, uh, put behind the misery of of Portland. Why? What happened in Portland? A whole lot of nothing, James. Well, well, and I think that's the problem. Yes and no. I mean, okay. So I guess we'll we'll get into it. Uh, so you were very quick on Friday in yes with both primaries and alternates, which you get to run both on Fridays. Yes. Um, and then Saturday morning you were quick again, and then Saturday afternoon for qualifying, less quick or. Did everybody else just get faster or what's, what's, what's the story wishbone? You know, pal, I don't know that we understand. So everything that you said is correct. Um, Pato was right there with me. Actually, I think he was fourth and I was fifth in practice too. Yeah. Um, so we were like, we, we, we were both content. We were both happy. We were both quite competitive Cause yeah. Cause again, um, the, the margins were like super small in practice. Yeah. Like it we was were, we so were, tight. We were off in practice to the quickest lap by like half a 10th. Yeah. Right? Like so we like, had, we were talking about it, how like the top 14, I think were covered by two tens. And so we were making this joke where it's like, you see the guy who's like in 12th talking to his engineer and normally you'd be like, all right, what kitchen sink change are we making to go from 12th to get onto the front row sort of thing. And it's like, no, 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 guys. We're talking like 50 pounds of spring and one turn of front wing because you're not, it's not a time issue. It's just, it's so tight. Yeah. I mean, we, the car that we started with was the car that I drove all the way through practice and qualifying. Um, and it was a big shock for the best result of the team to be 18th. I mean, we were, we were 18th, 24th, and 25th, I think, which is like, on average, it was the worst qualifying by any team in the entire series. So um, there was a lot of head scratching after qualifying because, again, there wasn't a balance issue. Um, there wasn't a procedure issue. There wasn't traffic. There wasn't – it wasn't a, a case of, oh, we think we got you know a, a weird set of firestones because sometimes that can happen because the, the pace offset that we had seen from reds to blacks – um, in practice one was the same pace offset we had in qualifying. Usually when something weird happens, like you go slower on reds than you do on blacks, that sort of thing. Um, the tires in our mind were all in their correct windows and operating ranges, um, across all three cars and all three drivers kind of had the same opinion. They were like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to say here. Cause like everything felt as 
similar as possible as practice did um, a couple hours prior. And we were just kind of at a loss because it wasn't even a thing of like, oh, it's so tight and we missed by three hundreds, right? We missed by four tenths. So when you talk about like how the margins are so tight, like, yes, that is reality, but it wasn't for us. Like we were not even remotely close to transferring. So it was incredibly disappointing and, and very strange because like our theoreticals, you know, a theoretical lap, for those that don't know, is it takes all of your best sectors um, that may have come on different laps and it combines them to have like this ultimate mega lap, right? Our, and it does that for all the cars, or the timing and scoring software. Our theoreticals are still ninth. So it's not even like we had sectors that we just did on different laps that, you know, if we had put it all together, it would have transferred. Like we were just, there wasn't any pace there. Um, so we were at a bit of a loss as to what to do going into practice into warm up because like there wasn't anything I really needed from the car. It was just, how do we find more performance? So we, we kind of, all three cars went down a little bit of a path with some experimentation with tire pressures and spring packages and, and just seeing how we could try and, and get the tire to work a little bit better and, and activate a little bit more, if you will. Um, and, and warm up, you know, we were pretty competitive, you know, I thought our long run pace was good. And, and, um, so going into the race, we started, we ended up starting 17th because of some engine penalties, um, and got a decent start, um, avoided the, the, the chaos that was Pietro Fittipaldi, um, and kind of went off strategy a little bit and finished 12th. Like we, that was just kind of our day. We weren't incredible in the race from a speed standpoint we weren't terrible when you start that far back and there's really no yellows except for the one at the start like there's nothing you can really do right so it was very disappointing because we we really thought based on last year and based on mid ohio which was the last road course we did with the hybrid that we were going to be in really good shape yeah and we came in very confident and the first third of the weekend went exactly as we thought it was going to and then still a mystery to us how it all came unraveled because we didn't change anything. We just, I guess, didn't take the step that everyone else did. Um, because it's not even like going back to those theoreticals. It's not even like in practice one when we were second or practice two or fifth. It's not like on the theoreticals we were 12th and like no one was getting their lap in. Like we were first on theoreticals actually. So it's like, there was always the pace in the car until it counted, I guess, but yeah. like the only thing, the only thing that we can think that changed is like qualifying in the race were the warmest parts of the weekend, but we're still it wasn't a huge swing. No, it's not like it went from 60 degrees to 85. Like it right. went from 73 to 78. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I don't, I don't know, man, it was incredibly disappointing and frustrating. Um, the only bright spot is we finished a race for the first time in like eight weeks. So that's cool. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, four of those weeks we weren't racing and one of them yeah, you were still. off. But yeah, I guess <laughs> if you want to be, that's fair. Um, so do you feel like, because the thing, like you guys went on a pretty aggressive strategy in terms of pitting early on that first stop, which meant you were going to have to save the rest of the day. Um, a well-timed yellow could have helped out. That didn't come. So you were just kind of in fuel saving mode. But do you feel like you had pace in hand? Had no, you needed no, it on the because race, even... No, because even when the, you know how, when you do an undercut, you know, you, you open the stint with three or four pretty aggressive laps to try and, you know, maximize the new tires. And then you settle into a fuel number and that sort of thing. You know, David Malukas, even though like he ended up burning through tires. Um, so this isn't a totally fair comparison, but like we were on that similar strategy and there was a period of time where he was eight or nine tenths quicker than me. Wow. So like, yeah, that used up tires, but okay, call it half second that we were, that we were missing. And that was the same across all three cars. Like we finished 12th, 16th and 21st or something. So like, yeah, yeah. Not a great showing. You know, when you've been doing this for so long, you feel like you, you've seen it all sort of thing. And like, this was, this was one where I was very baffled because usually there's a reason. There's a reason why X, Y, and Z didn't happen. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I wouldn't have changed even today on Tuesday, three days later, I wouldn't have changed anything that we did going into qualifying. Right. Cause I don't have like it for me, it was a perfect execution from everyone. And right. 
yeah. balance was good. Lap was good. Yeah. Just pace wasn't there. And that's the hard part too, right? Again, again, if you have as a, as a, in a singularity event, one car has a bad weekend, you're always hopeful that like you get the car back to the shop and they rip it apart and they find something funky with part X, Y, Z, whatever. When it's all three cars, you know, that's not going to happen. Right. And the fact yeah, that the I weekend mean, started strong and then pivoted so aggressively, like that's a, that is a weird scenario. Very weird. Um, but the reality is uh, not my problem anymore because I'm not <laughs> driving a car on a road course again for them. So <laughs> great point. Great point. So, yeah. Yeah. Good point. I don't think about it like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the race itself honestly was pretty dull. Uh, well, you know, there was a couple characters that livened it up a little bit. I thought. Oh yeah, oh um, yeah. There was there yeah. was some action, just not up front, I yeah. guess. Uh, yeah. What uh, did you did you come across anything in particular that was noteworthy? Uh, Pietro, I came across Pietro. Um, here's the thing, man. I I see his point of like, hey, you know, Dixon was pushed off and then came back on and this sort of thing and blah blah blah. But like, yeah but we have two pedals in the car. Like, I, so the, I don't know. It just, the, it was, a, the thing it was for a me is pretty just wild situation. Having not obviously been on the track. Again. That is true. You were right behind Scott, weren't you? Yeah. 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 You had to hit the brakes cause he fired across your nose. Yes. Um, yeah. the, the thing I was willing to give him, but, but again, not having been on track all weekend is like, okay, fine. That door's closing. He's got a closing rate on Scott. Scott's kind of mold merging into the back to like the normal racing line through that little, kink if you want to call it and there's that curb there at no point in running in practice on your own would you have been any amount of wheels over that curb you just don't do it right so like the there's the curb then there's some pavement before the wall there's a gap big enough for a car so if you're pietro dixon's bogged down you're closing on him and by going driver's right there's enough gap between Dixon and the wall to get through. You just got to kind of go over this curb in a weird way. Is there any way that he should have known that the curb strike was going to case the car and lift the front tires off the ground and fire him into Scott? Because that's, that's the only thing is like, no. I get the, the two pedal point, but like, man, you think of the curb strikes that we like chucking it over the curbs in like five, six at Indy GP or something like that. And you're like, yeah, all right, I can take a bit of curb here. And what it might, might bounce a little, but like, I've got the momentum. I should clear them. That's fair. It's a fair point. Like why, why there's an elevated curb there in the first place is kind of a weird one. Right. Um, cause that should just be painted on us. Right. Yeah. Or nothing. But um, so, but yeah, that, that, yeah, that's a valid argument. Yeah. Cause like I look at it from, from race calls perspective of the penalty, which I guess I kind of get because you look at what the criteria are for a penalty. Passing cars, more responsibility. Contact led to one car being out of the race. It wasn't just like he was pushed off and, and missed it. I think that's the big hitter, right? Yeah. Like, we've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Anytime that your actions end someone's day, yeah. like it's, it's a penalty. Yeah, yeah. It's true. I mean, he, he wasn't like out of control in the sense that like he didn't come in, brakes all smoked up, but I guess he wasn't in control because his front tires weren't on the ground. Technically, yes. If you want to be. criteria are met. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I get it. I was, I, was a, I was a little more on the fence before, but with time to reflect, I'd say it's probably the right move. And, so and I just for the for people him. that aren't race car drivers, you generally want all four tires on the ground? Uh, usually. Not always. Usually. Okay. Just checking. Um. Now the drop kicking of Connor into turn one, yeah, that one that was a very clear penalty. <laughs> um, um, and then there was one other incident with a Junko's car in turn one that, dude, maybe James would like to talk about. I, I mean, <laughs> I I feel like I said too much in the broadcast. I was very baffled by. I mean, that, that was pretty bad. Even yeah, I mean, even from my perspective, I could tell. Hey, they shouldn't do that. The, <laughs> like, the reentry. You know, dangerous reentry is always something that like you have to take very seriously. And it's something that I get really fired up about. Not to say I've I'm not saying I've been innocent my entire career, but it's just it's just such a dangerous thing. And yeah, when Grosjean spun and then looped it back around, fine. But then it's like drove right to the apex of turn two, apparently without looking. Or like maybe he saw Rasmussen coming and thought he could get there in time. I don't know. 
Either way, it was the wrong move, even before he made the move. It's not like with the benefit of hindsight. With the benefit of like decades of experience driving race cars, you know that that's the wrong move. So that one was very surprising. And I felt bad for Christian that he just got smoked in that whole deal. Because again, that car is in the leader circle battle, right? We're honestly well, like- Do you want to know what the, what, the, what the crazy thing about the result of that is? Okay, and this is like- the championship, let's be honest. Well, maybe not, but well, I was just going to say, it, it was might pretty be. much over. We're spending more time talking about the leader circle thing at this point. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it might not be over, but it's pretty much over because I think all Alex has to do is like finish seventh every weekend. So because of the result of the 20 car that Christian Rasmussen was driving, because he got smoked by Grosjean through no fault of Christian's own, guess who he's tied with? Connor Daly in the 78. He's tied with Connor Daly in the 78. And Connor, <laughs> I don't think, has entirely forgiven Ed for things that happened a while ago. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be quite a little battle that's going on there to see who can sneak in for the last spot. And I mean, I feel like there's other cars that are still also in the conversation. Yeah. Like those guys for are just 100%. 22nd yeah. and 23rd, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. uh, the, I think Stingray's. One of the ones Stingray got a bit of a buffer because he had that ninth place in Gateway. Um, oh, right. So okay. A huge result. Right. Um, I'm trying but to yeah, Stingray's, Stingray's still fighting. You know, the, I think the 51 car is still fighting. I don't think fighting. it's even close. I thought, I thought is both coin cars were pretty far out of. But speaking of the 51 car, let's talk about that for a second. Toby Sowery. Good job, man. Hmm. Like I didn't watch, I, I obviously haven't watched the race, but I saw the end result and I saw like the highlights of what mm. he was doing. And I mean, he beat two McLaren cars in qualifying. So <laughs> doing something right. <laughs> but honestly, more than anything, man, like the race craft is really strong, really, really strong. And coming into a series, you know, cold, hadn't been an open wheel car in a while, uh, mid season, you know, cause obviously his first race was mid Ohio. He was impressive in mid Ohio. We have seen the odd case of a driver coming in, doing a mid season one-off race, being very impressive and then really not backing it up ever again. It, it, for whatever reason, it was kind of fluky. Uh, not the case. He went to Toronto, most difficult place to go drive an Indy car with very little experience, did a very good job again. And like now it's to the point where, now you'd expect it. I think his IndyCar season is also finished because of the road courses being done. But he had some awesome moves down the back straight. He had a, the coolest side-by-side -side battle of the race, which you saw the replay of with, with uh, Kirkwood. Four, five, six, seven, eight, side-by-side, -side, high, low, and cutting back. Like, really, really good, clean, hard, respectful racing from both those guys. But Toby's just doing a great job, man. So I hope that that's opened some eyes and maybe some doors uh, created some opportunities for him because he kind of deserves that. Um, yeah, up front, it was all power all day. Polo, you know, tried to keep him honest, but got really close in traffic one time at throwing a, throwing a lunge down into seven kind of thing, but it's not worth it and wasn't quite close enough. But uh, yeah, Will just owned that one, man. Got the lead in turn one, literally never looked back. Very strong, impressive performance. I want to hear Tim's opinion on qualifying. Okay. Um, <laughs> that took me a second. I don't know if I have much of an opinion on qualifying. I thought you guys were going to do better, and then I stopped watching. Oh, are you talking about because Santino got P1? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I stopped. As soon as you didn't advance, I stopped watching. That's fair, but you still saw the result. <laughs> Mildly yeah. offensive. I mean, I'm still working, but whatever. I, you know, I was, I was, doing, I was doing stuff with Hazel and... Yeah. Uh, that you would have ignored right. had Alex advanced, but whatever, hey, I watched it's cool. practice, and I, you know, I texted Ew. you about practice stuff. Yeah, that's true. No, I mean, You're dodging the question here. You guys have all told me how hard it is to qualify on pole, so I'm going to go ahead and assume he did a hell of a job and deserves some praise on it. Well said. Because yeah. not only did he qualify on pole, we were just talking about how tight the margins were, and yeah. all through qualifying they were tight until the fast six, what he had a lap good enough for pole and then went a 10th faster than that and ended up like a 10th and a half quicker than power, which wild, wild. I mean, just cause I don't much care for Santino doesn't mean I'm not going to point out if he did something well. Credit where credit's due, man. Did yeah. a good job. And he's like ninth in points, 10th of points. 10th power backup. 
Sorry, sorry. <laughs> he was sorry. He was tied with Rosenquist for tenth going into the mm. weekend, mm. and now he mm. had a better day than Rosenquist. That is my domain. Is oh, you nine? <laughs> the old P nine. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. The old P nine. I live and die in P nine. It would seem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got three races to change that still. I mean, um, yeah, but it's going to be pretty tough. Yeah, it's ovals, right? Yeah. It's, well, you never no, know. that's good. But like um, the gap to eighth is pretty significant. Oh, Anyways, it? it doesn't matter. I talked about the amount of DNF. This is the most DNFs I've ever had in my career. So in a single season. So Oh, cool. How many are you up in, to? In reality, oh, this is five. We're at five. Is that including the DNS? Yeah. Okay, so five no scores, and you're still in the top ten in points. That's actually pretty good if you think about it. <laughs> that's, I guess. So that's why I'm saying like it's actually been a really good year, minus yeah. all of the races that I have not finished. <laughs> yeah. You're Anytime like, hey, you can finish, we, it's all right. You know, you're like, can yeah, we just yeah. can we move to a point system where you get like I don't know five drops? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mulligan. I'm calling a yeah. Mulligan on that. Just one. take yeah. your ten best results. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but no, that's not how it works. So anyways, so, so that's Portland. Um, we don't really need to talk about it anymore. Well, James, you had one thing you want to bring up. You had props that you brought, I think. Guys, this has been a common theme over the last few months of us talking on this podcast. And it is how often we are approached at the racetrack. This, this year seems to have reached a whole new level by you, the listener. And mentioning how much you like the show and how specifically often you, you, Steven. Sorry, well, I just yeah. figured we got to have like one guy named Steven. And I want to freak him out. I yeah, just okay. wanna... You didn't hold it long enough, but yeah. Steve, oh, thanks for the I support. I can edit it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> um, and, you know, how much you guys appreciate the show, you like the show, and how much you dislike Tim and wish he would stop doing stuff. Yeah, I get, and I've we, been getting a lot more of those comments, by the yeah, way. Yeah, which Steve again... Does. We thank you, our loyal listeners. It just listeners. makes me want to talk more. <laughs> so <laughs> another thing that ha- that has happened in that same time period is Taylor Swift became a big deal. And nope. she's a singer. You look her up. Anyway, um, she's, she's, this, she's gotten this bracelet thing going, this friendship bracelet trend going, right? Which I think is awesome. Is that where this started? Yeah, I, I, well, that's where I think it came from. I don't know. That, that was my assumption. Because Does I know she that's a friendship bracelet. She like if you go to a Taylor Swift concert, apparently like they come loaded to like their elbows with con- with and they just give them to random people. They're just like you just give them to people. Like you take them from people, and it's just like this little community of sharing bracelets. Because I know I know I know when you go, you get like one of these bands that's like LED Bluetooth thing that goes with the certain songs and the whole stadium no, no, I, lights I, up. I, I don't but think this is she gives them away. It's like the fan oh. community, the this T Swift community has. I don't well, know. That's if she's, nice. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. So like people will show up with this, like they'll spend hours making them and they'll just give them away to people and then they'll get some from other people and it's this whole like friendship. Yeah, because they, be, they can't be easy to make and no. the amount of, of these things that are going around is pretty amazing. It's pretty impressive. Like, I, was, yeah. I was joking how like Taylor Swift like single-handedly has boosted the sales of all arts and crafts stores in America <laughs> by like 8,000%. Oh, Michael's is still in business just because Dude, of her, it would seem. 100%. Yeah. So- so a she's lot of in, our fans she's in the pocket of big bead is what you're saying. Big, right. Big beads. So, so fans come up to us and they give us these bracelets. They take the time to make them and it's incredible. And so like I keep mine around the microphone stand. So I got a bunch here and they're really nice. They're things like mayor of Hinchtown and, and off track. Uh, what is this? This one says booty squad. I think that's actually yours, Alex. I think somebody gave me that one to get to you. <laughs> That makes um, sense because me and Pat have the best butts. Yeah. Right, there you go. Yeah. Uh, that's, you guys have that's like adorable data that has uh, that's that's found we do. that right. We do. Yeah. Me, we got, Felix, and Pat are the fattest asses in the series. There you go. And NBC Hinchtown. There was actually one a very very sweet. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna lady. need my booty bracelet, bro. I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> she made me a Weller one. She gave it to me in St. Pete and it was right oh, so before we went on air. Well, that's the thing. Like we were standing at the front of the grid and we were about to go on air and you know, like the crowd's always behind us at the front of the grid. And she like called my name and I looked over and, and she was like kind of, so I came over and she made me a Weller bracelet and I was like, so kind of like choked up about it. I, I thanked her, but I feel like I didn't thank her enough. So if you're listening, <laughs> I've been staring at this thing for like the last four or five months and really, really appreciate it. It's very sweet. 
Let's my, my favorite one that I've ever seen, not, it was not for me. It was for Pato. Cause that kid gets all of them. Um, <laughs> he gets like a thousand a week. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, and this hasn't happened once, but like he's gotten a couple bracelets that instead of it saying phone like, numbers or whatever, phone, phone numbers. numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 that is, <laughs> which is hilarious. Awesome. Yeah. And like, you know what? He's, he's probably one of the thirstiest guys in IndyCar. I think it could work, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Podcaster so number one. Anyway. Um, so this weekend, I had a couple people come up and, and give me bracelets and I often get bracelets for you, Alex, cause they don't, might not run into you. It's like, Hey, can you give this to Alex? I, last week I got one for you, Tim, which I did give to you or you or maybe, yep. you, yeah, I gave it to you. I like it. It's a podcaster. I have it it's upstairs. a podcaster, uh, three. Yes. <laughs> I forgot we got, about the we three. got yeah. one and two. <laughs> did, oh yeah. I dropped the one, your years off on your bus. Did you get it? Alex? Maybe. Yeah. I think Mac has it. Anyway, okay. I got given two by someone to say, Hey, could you, could you pass these on to Thim for me? And one of them is producer Thim, as you can see here. I love it, love it. But then, most impressively, there was a purple and pink one that says Hazel. (laughs) So Hazel is now uh, podcast famous and has gotten a friendship bracelet from some very nice fans uh, in Portland. She will, she will love that. So that thank is, you. that is thank the, uh, that yeah, thank you to everybody. So that is the, the button on Portland, Milwaukee. It's a place in Wisconsin. I've heard of it. Um, known for its beer. Um, and yeah. baseball team, which is named for its beer. It is. <laughs> so it all comes together. Uh, and then, yeah, you guys got a double header coming up. Sure do. We sure do. God, I hate those. I really don't like them. Why? Double headers? Yeah. Uh, fundamentally, I don't like them because it's a advantage to anybody that happens to have a really good car at that track. Um, I also think it's a lot of work on the crews and it means that we have like less race weekends to meet like a 17 race schedule. All valid points, James. All valid points. Other than so, that, they're great. Not a bad thing to say about Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, might as well give the six trophies to Penske at this point. Uh, <laughs> I'm now, is kidding. This, is this based on the test or just the general oval performance of that squad in the last two years? Both. Yes. Um, yes, correct. So I uh, I got to test there two months ago, two-ish months ago, three months ago. Um, had never been there before. Had always been told how much... I would like it, how much people that had raced there loved it and all this sort of thing. And all of that rang super true. Um, it's a really cool lap to drive it. Uh, listen, we were wrong with how gateway raced. We were completely wrong. So who knows? It, it might be awesome. So we're just going to have to see what the tire ambient and downforce combination presents itself with in terms of a product. Um, what I do know is I've seen online and it's been confirmed by several people that pretty much all of the fair concession stands that are kind of around the facility will be open and serving food. And I think that's awesome because that's huge. Th- this track is inside of fairgrounds. And so when you drive in, all you see is all the fair stuff and you're already like your mouse watering. So the fact that all of those vendors are opening their doors um, is really cool. And um, Hy-Vee is the promoter for it. So we all know that they do a great job at Iowa. So I would expect the same minus Post Malone and company. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we're getting to the end here. So it's, you got to enjoy it and um, hope that you can have some good results to close out the season. So as you said, we all kind of got gateway wrong. And I think it was a couple of different things that played into that, but it wasn't even really evident until, well, look, the second, the night practice, felt good but everyone's like ah it's not gonna be night when we race so it's not gonna be as good and ended up being cool enough that it was fine so first question what's the downforce package for milwaukee is it same or similar as gateway all of it all of it so max down all of it yes so this is good because a it makes it you know it gives you more grip to try to go on to the second lane and makes the car well, slower the first lane the, in milwaukee well, yeah, I'm at the second usable lane, which is lane one. Yeah. 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 Um, it makes the car s- slower on the straightaways, which means the straightaways are longer, which means it is better chance of passing. And they create more drag, so more draft, so better chance of passing. So all those things are good. 
Um, temperature wise, it doesn't look cold. It doesn't look bad. High 70s. It'll be all right. So that's all right. So at the test, from what I understand, like nobody was really using the low lane. You couldn't really get down there. Well, it didn't help that it was covered in mud. So right. I would imagine it'll be less muddy when we go back. I, I certainly hope so. would assume. Yeah. Let's not do that. Well, yeah. I mean, you know what happens when you assume you look mm. stupid sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So anyways, I would say if it wasn't, you know, muddy, that it would probably be better. Okay. Just a guess. Okay. So that's, that's, that's positive. I look, I feel like I'll personally bring a power washer to the track and clean I up lane one. If that hasn't you happened don't yet. have one. No, no, I borrowed my neighbors. So I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, so when yeah, you Tim, leave on Thursday, you're going to have a power washer in your car. Is that what I'm hearing? I say if it's not, but I'll reach out to people. So you're you're going to drive home to pick up your power washer. That's not yours. No, no, and then drive pick back. up his neighbor's power washer. No, no I'm his at neighbors. home now. No, I, I know. So when you leave on Thursday, you're going to. To see how, how's the track send picks. And if it looks dirty, I will bring my own power washer. And which I will power own. wash the truck, which I don't own. I'm going to borrow it from my neighbor, Dennis, who's a lovely guy and his wife, Terry. They've let me use it. How are you 40 years old and done on power washer? No, I have one. It broke. And I haven't, like, I wanted to do my patio. Like, oh, because you don't live in India anymore. You, you don't. Right. It's hard. I don't have a lot of time to get stuff fixed when I'm never sure. here. Right. Right. Um, so that's, that's part of that. Uh, we say anyway. to the only one of us in Indiana right now. That's a good point. I mean, Tim, you've Listen, probably spent Linda. almost as much time in Indiana as I have this year. <laughs> <laughs> you've been here a fair amount. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Uh, so, yes, I'm sure the track will be better, and I'm excited about that. And I honestly think the fact that there's two races might actually be a benefit because by the second race, we've got a full race's worth of rubber on both lanes. Makes it way worse because everyone like makes their cars better. So then everyone's pretty much sorted and no one has any balance issues. And Interesting. I never thought about that. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Race two is always worse. Well, race one is at like five o'clock, five thirty local. Okay. And race yeah. two is at like twelve thirty, one o'clock local. Couldn't tell you. Haven't looked the calendar. But um, <laughs> moving on. That's Milwaukee. So come check it out. Um, and basically yeah, come because come. all, all y'all have bitched and moaned about how we don't race in Milwaukee. So if people don't show up, I'm gonna be real pissed. This is a good time to tell you I'm not coming. F1 news, big news, big news. Logan Sargent is, uh, is out mm -hmm. at Williams and mm -hmm. America no longer has a freedom representative, mm -hmm. um, on the grid, which is mm -hmm. very sad. It's sad because it's just sad. You don't, yeah. I don't care if it's you like a driver or not. Like you don't wish that on anyone, especially when no. it's F1 and you've worked so hard and overcome so many obstacles, obstacles to get to this point. You know, you're not coming back in 25. That's the big thing, right? Is like realistically, he like knew it, it was over and now he doesn't even get yeah. to see it out. Like he, he probably didn't know that Zanvoort was going to be his last race. And so no. you don't even get to enjoy the swan song of it all, which it is, it, is, it bites man. It definitely sucks for him. I do feel very bad for him. Um, and who's their replacement is, yeah, is wild. Who is this guy? Um, I've never heard this name. Guy I've never heard of. Um, there was something, I'm going to pull it up on Twitter. He's an F2 guy. I found it hilarious. And again, I'm not saying that I don't understand where Williams is coming from. It's been a very, very bad kind of year plus um, from Logan. would like to point out while you're looking this up that Logan has out has never out qualified Albon, but has out qualified Checo like five or six times. <laughs> Fair. So, um, Fred Smith tweeted this Franco's resume advantages on Logan Sargent. Number one is a different guy. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> Number two, looks and sounds like a person who is not Logan Sargent. <laughs> number three. Oh, man. Number three. Three Asian Le Mans LMP2 podiums. Okay. And that's it. <laughs> so, like, I get why they felt they needed to replace Logan. The fact that that was what they chose is well, a little is, weird. This is what I don't get. So, Mercedes... Engines in a Williams. Mercedes is very likely to be announcing Kimi Antonelli going to that car. He's doing his first FP1 this week in Monza. It's 
rumored to be announced in Monza that he's going to be in the car full time next year. Mercedes, Toto Wolf, James Vowell's very strong relationship. He came from there. It's already been rumored. Mercedes had already asked for an exemption for the 18 year old rule for Antonelli at some point. Never happened because he's now turned 18 or he turns 18 this weekend or something. Why not just put Antonelli in? Why isn't Toto being like, hey, if you're kicking Log- Logan out, we'll pay or you. Liam Lawson or. Well, I can like, see why Red Bull wouldn't want Liam there. I get that. Okay. But I don't get why Mercedes doesn't want Kimmy in that seat. I don't understand why Williams wouldn't want Kimmy in that seat. But OK, fine. Yeah. I mean, we're never going to know that. But it's it's kind of what we've talked about with the whole Sergio situation. And Red Bull's decision through all of the back and forth to end up keeping him because, you know, you know, the skeletons in your own closet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is this guy who has three Asian Le Mans LMP2 podiums like that much better than Logan to deal with all of this? Like, it's not like you're putting Vettel in the car, right? right? It's not like you're putting Ricardo, who was say he wasn't employed anymore like back in the someone recent right back in the car you're putting someone who is also young and has never done doesn't, it doesn't has never done it and i isn't wouldn't say standout. has like isn't a standout in junior formula like a uh, nico holkenberg was or jules bianchi or any of these guys Oscar right George Gastry, Russell. George Le- or right. Charles Leclerc. so like why why money i don't it, i don't know all I know is the headline and then the the resume differences. So that is <laughs> that's pretty comical. Uh, we can talk usually about pretty funny on uh, on Twitter, but that was that was particularly good. Well played, Fred. Yeah. Um, and before that was announced, Lando Norris crushed everybody in Zandvoort. Oh my god! Like it's it's that's hard to do, even in F one with all of the advantages that exist between cars and at different tracks on varying weekends, 22 seconds is it's massive, man. And like the gap for pole was like three and a half tenths at a short track. Now I know Max made a mistake on his last lap, but it was still going to be his lap pretty hard. It was still going to be two Mm. tenths. Disagree. I think, I think actually Max would have beat him. You think Max would have done in 11, 12 there or whatever. You think it was that much time loss? Max Max would have done what he always does and figured a way to pull something out of his ass by three hundreds. Well, you say that, but then Lando had a three tenth a lap pace advantage in the race and won for sure seventy two lap race by twenty two seconds. So one hundred percent, yeah, yeah. What's what's so obviously the McLaren was just unbelievable. And look, once again, Lando did not lead lap one. Max did Max things and took the lead on the start. Very short run to the first corner, and he still beat him. But then Lando just put his head down, didn't get panicked, and passed him on track like seven laps later. Conversely, you got Oscar, same car, very good driver, couldn't quite match Lando in qualifying, didn't even beat Max in qualifying, and finished 30 seconds behind his teammate. That's not good. That's, you know, that's that's Perez and Verstappen differences. So, like, what happened to Piastri this weekend? Um, I think Piastri just, it was one of those weekends where he just got Stuck. beat. Um, I don't think he was bad. Like he finished fourth. Um, I think Lando was just, you know, on a different, on a different level this weekend. Um, I would say my, my driver of the day though, I mean, obviously Lando, but I think what Charles did in his car, which was a box, let's be honest, um, was amazing because I watched, I only watched the last like 35 laps of the race. And I was like, Oh, there's no way that he's going to hold on to the podium. Cause like some of the snaps lap, that he was having and like wheel spin moments. Oh, yeah. it was absurd. And with the pace that the McLaren had, um, I thought that he was a sitting duck. So the fact that he held onto it was very impressive. Yeah. 10 lap pace at disadvantage to Piastri. Like you say, we know the pace of the McLaren. He drove around max in a red bull. So like, again, that's, that's kind of why I'm like, was Oscar not on his, on his best, but I'm with you, man. And like, and Charles got there by driving around dudes. Like he made some, good passes on track and like just got the job done in a car that was nine tenths off pole. So that was a huge result. Gasly did a really good job, like being Mr. Defense and just hanging on the outside of turn one. Every time somebody tried to pass him and just rim shot of that thing and kept so many guys behind him. He did a really good job. Uh, that's a fun track. Did you ever race there in like, never, unfortunately. No? I was no. sort of like, he didn't, cause he didn't do F3. Did you? No. Yeah. It's, it is a cool track and it's obviously a bit different. Like the last section is a bit different now, but, um, 
That's a fun one to drive. It'd be it'd be insane in an F1 car. It's just, it just almost seems too small for an F1 car. But for as much as we joke about F1, or as much as I've joked about F1 and how you know it's it was going to be Max dominated all season, it's been a pretty interesting season. I mean, oh, dude. He's not not been as dominant as everybody was expecting. It's been huge. He hasn't won a race in like six races. So but I think that, there's a very very good chance that McLaren beats him in the constructor championship. I think really? it's almost an inevitability. I mean, they cut the yeah. points deficit down by 20 ish. So what, what, what happened? What caused that? Well, Sergio hasn't scored Mc, any points really. Mc, yeah, so. McLaren got good yeah, and Sergio I mean, like, got bad. McLaren. What, how did McLaren have such a market jump forward? <sighs> Just updates, man. They, they, you know, updated the car around Miami and that was immediately quick and, and bore fruit. And then they hadn't really updated it between Miami, which was round five. And this race, which was round 15, while other teams were doing like regular small updates, they did one big one in Miami and then one kind of big one this weekend. And obviously the one this weekend worked. So obviously, you know, Zanford's a very high downforce place. So it doesn't put an emphasis on efficiency. It does on traction, which the McLaren's very good in like low speed traction events. Uh, so it does sort of suit it a little bit. Monza will be interesting because it is all about aero efficiency. Traction is still very important, but it'll be interesting to see if the advantage kind of goes back to Red Bull a little bit, if Mercedes just shows up out of nowhere like they've done a couple times this year. But that's just the thing. You don't know, right? 12 months ago, we could have told you who's going to be on pole and who's going to win the race every weekend. And 21 out of 24 times, we'd have been right. Pretty good hit rate. Now, like going into Monza, no idea. Literally no idea, which is great. This is why people tune in. So uh, I'm excited to watch. We'll be watching from MKE. And excited to see Alex uh, tackle the mile for the first time in race Go conditions. roundy round. Go roundy round. So Time's there you go, through. guys. That's our time. Appreciate you showing up. Thanks for the friendship bracelets. Thanks for coming to Portland. You better, you better be coming to Milwaukee. You better be coming to Milwaukee. I was gonna, I was, I was gonna go to Santa Barbara instead. No, you don't have to come. We don't actually want okay. you in Milwaukee. Whew, okay, Whew. everybody else. <laughs> And uh, have fun at uh, Butterball Farms. It's Butterworth Inn, but okay. Sorry, sorry. This has been Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. Off Track is part of the Sirius XM Sports Podcast Network. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review. Subscribe today wherever you stream your podcasts. We're at Ask Off Track on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to follow us on Twitter individually, I'm at Hinchtown. He's Alexander Rossi. And if you want to follow Tim, though we have no idea why you would, he's at the Tim Durham on Twitter. Follow us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel for exclusive video content. Off track is produced by Tim Durham, and by that we mean Tim. Hold up. 